Hello everyone. Welcome to my talk. Yeah, so today I'll be talking about Django security best practices. Um, but before I get started, I want to know, do we have Django developers here? Django devs? Wow, wow, full house. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, if you are here, you do web development and you don't use Django. Can I see you? Web development, you don't use Django. Nobody, okay. Ah, what happened, guys? You don't do Flask? Nah, nobody's in. <laughs> Fast API. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. So, well, um, when it comes to Python, I think Django takes the lead. I'm a pro Django anytime, any day. So, I do a lot of stuff with Django. So, my name is Joseph ADDG. I'm a software developer. I build mostly with Python and Django. Um, these days, I play with HTMX on the front end to add some spice to the um, Django template. And also, I'm a technical writer. Um, I love writing about Python, Django, Linux, and um, everything in between. So today, we'll be talking about security. Um, you agree with me that security is actually very, very important, especially in this time and season. Um, acts are happening here and there. Data breaches are happening here and there. Recently, I heard that you can buy NIN at 100 Naira. <laughs> yeah, NIN. Yeah, NIN. Did someone even bought the one for the Minister of Communications online? Yeah, he bought his NIN for 100 Naira. So <laughs> that, those are the things that are happening. And that's why security is very, very important. So building an app is one thing. Um, securing the app is actually another thing. And today we are going to look at authentication and authorization. They look similar, but they are very, very different. We will talk about web attacks, um, environment variables, and some other things that um, can help you secure your Django application. So why care about security? Why? You know, a lot of times we build app, or let me say, um, especially beginners when you are learning Django, the only thing you care about is making sure that the app works. And as long as the app works, everything is fine. Everybody moves on. Nobody cares. And then you start deployment. You put the app out there. And then you, everybody's, ah, my app is out. The thing is working. And you are fine. Everybody's OK. But then it goes beyond building an app, especially if you are building an app that stores user data. For example, you build an app that collects KYC information. You're asking people to give you their BVN number. You're asking people to give you their NIN number. You are collecting, you know, their pictures. And then... Sorry, please. Hello, please. Let's set you down. Um, okay. If you need to talk, you can go outside so that you don't distract um, the talk. Thank you. So, you collect all of this data. Pictures, um, NIN, BVN, personal information, the addresses. But then what are you doing to protect this data? Can someone enter into your system and then they are able to extract all of this information that the users have entrusted to you? You know, there are a lot of apps out there. They ask you these days, it's, we, we understand. KYC is very, very important. I'm a fan of KYC. But then when people are doing KYC, they should do it right. There are some apps, I don't know, once I look at the way everything is structured, and I don't trust you enough. I, I would rather not use the app than give you my BVN or other personal information. Because um, a lot of things are happening these days. And right now, it's even very, very easy to impersonate people, especially with AI. You know, if you see stuff that AI is doing right now, someone can clone your entire image and everything, and then they will look exactly like you. They create accounts, they create profiles that will feel like you. They will call people on phone, they will sound like you. <laughs> and then they will send your, your people will send money and then you'll be wondering you who called you they, they will sound like you so these are things that happen and that is why security is very very important right now so last year there was about 2,300 cyber attacks with more than 343 million victims worldwide that's a lot of numbers in 2023 there was 72% increase in data breaches in 2023. And of course, that's one of the reasons why your NIN and BVN are everywhere right now. You know? <laughs> so, data breaches cost about 4.4 million on average. That was last year. So, this thing is a serious, very serious thing. People are losing money. 
people are losing money and things are happening, especially uh, when it comes to data breaches. Some of the notable ones that happened, in 2020, there was an hack in Twitter. I don't know if anybody remember that. Elon Musk account, people were donating Bitcoin. Somebody entered into Elon Musk account and then was tricking people to send Bitcoin to a particular address. And people were sending Bitcoin, thinking they were dealing with Elon Musk. He took $121,000 in Bitcoin in 2020. So all, all of these things might look, uh, there's no big deal how many people are there. But then um, when, when you build a platform or when you build a system and then this system, hackers or malicious people are able to extract data. They're able to hack into the system. A lot of things can happen. You may be thinking, oh, nothing will happen. But the person that is coming to attack you, they have a plan, a game plan of how they are going to exploit your system and uh, make money from it. So how do you secure your app? First thing, authentication. Authentication and authorization may look alike, but they are different. Authentication means ensuring that you are who you say you are. For example, my authentication here is I'm Joseph DJ, right? This is me. Usually, to authenticate a user, you have a username and a password. So somebody puts a username, they put a password, you check against your record, is this person who they say they are, right? If the username and password is correct, you let the person enter into the app authenticated. Authorization is, do you have the permission to do that thing you want to do? So, for example, somebody logs in with their username and password. Do they have the permission to go to the admin dashboard? Even though you have an account on the app, are you allowed to access the admin dashboard? That is authorization. So authorization controls things that the user can do. And I've seen this a couple of times where people build apps and then they don't differentiate between the two. So for example, let's say you are working on an LMS, LMS learning management system. Usually you have a student and you have a teacher. Now when people sign up, you need to assign them rules. Is this person signing up as a student or this person is signing up as a teacher? Now if everybody is creating the same account and there is no rules, <laughs> what will happen is a teacher will be able to do what the student is doing that one may not be bad. But then, a student being able to do what the teacher is supposed to do. You know, imagine students logging in and then they have access to the teacher's dashboard and then they can go and change their scores. <laughs> you, you, you can see. So that's where authorization comes in. So you have to make sure that when someone comes in, after they log in, they're authenticated, make sure that they are only able to do that thing they are supposed to do. Give them the only the permissions that they need to do just that thing. So it is very, very important. So like the LMS the sample that I gave you, I've actually seen that somewhere before, that somebody built something like that. It just, Django, you know Django has this authentication system, user model, did all those things, but everybody sign up, you sign up. The only thing is the URL. If you're able to know the URL that takes you to the teacher's dashboard, and you're able to trace, your, find your way there, you'll be able to access what the teachers are able to access, and you can do a lot of stuff in the app. <laughs> you understand? So this is like the first step um, for security when you are building a Django app. Some of the other things you can do is you can um, enforce strong passwords, which is very, very important. Um, I think most of the time Django Auth allows you to do this easily. Then two-factor authentication, you can, yeah, I've talked about road-based access, then session management. So you can have session timeout and automatic logout for users. This is also good, especially in this part of the world where people borrow computers, um, borrow um, smartphones to log in and stuff like that. Uh, recently, I did um, a job for one MFB, and one of the things they requested was that session timeout should be max 30 minutes. So, no matter what you are doing, once you have logged in, after 30 minutes, you are automatically logged out. And this is some of the features that you can put um, into your application to make it secure. So, now web attacks, apart from um, access control and um, people get into the system and doing things they're not supposed to do. Another common form of um, security flaw is the web attacks, especially XSS and CSRA. Luckily for us, um, Django is a framework that is built um, on security. The, the old, that's one of the things I love about Django. Django has all these tools, all these um, features that allows you to do a lot of stuff. But the problem is that by default, they are not enabled. They are not enabled. They have all those features, but then for you as a developer, you have to actually go there, 
enable these things so that you can be able to use them. So for XSS, Django provides you with um, middlewares and stuff that actually make it easy. I'm going to show you how to enable this on your Django app. For CSRF, I'm very sure you are very familiar with CSRF token, right? Now, if you build a form in Django, you don't put it there, you all know the answer. You always get an error. The form is not going to go through because Django has that built in. You have to include that code into, um, into the request when you are making the request. So, for the XSS attack, we have escaping um, inputs, which is very, very important. Then, thankfully, Django does this automatically in the templates. Um, but you as a person manually, in few cases, you might turn that off. Um, there was a time I actually need, I needed to do that to turn off the escaping, output escaping in this code. I was using one text editor, and then there was a little bit of conflict, so I had to do it manually, but then I had to switch off Django Zone. Input sanitization is very, very important, um, and also content security uh, policies. For CSRF, you can, we have the CSRF token, which comes with um, every Django forms. But then where the mistake usually comes from is when you are doing Ajax request. When you are doing Ajax request, you are not doing the usual Django process of form submission. You are trying to use JavaScript to do all those stuff. When you are doing that, you need to be very careful to make sure that you are also using CSRF tokens so that you can actually secure the form submission. Um, so, moving forward, good. Now, let's talk about the bug. Let's be sincere. How many people have set the bug to true in production? Don't lie. You have done it before. The bug true. Yes. We've done it before. <laughs> yeah. It happens. And a lot of times, what happens is that uh, you built the app, you deployed it. After deploying, something is not working well. So you want to quickly check what is wrong. And then you quickly go and set the bug to true. And then you see that thing, then you fix that error. The error is gone. Then you not see that thing. Then you not remember that you have to change the bug. And then you just leave the bug there and then you go. Then one day, one day, somebody will come and tell you that this is what your app is showing. You know, it happened to me one time that somebody said, this is what your app is showing. When you now sent me the screenshot, one of, thank God it was my friend. I was like, ah, how come my app is showing this? You know, I had to quickly go back to the server, then go and change the bug. It happens. But this is a very, very delicate um, matter. And um, the truth of the matter is setting the bug to true has a lot of implications. A lot. With this little mistake, you expose your app to a lot of attacks. With, when the bug is true, people can see detailed error pages. From the detailed error page, you can know everything about a Django app. They will see your URL structure. They will know your admin page. They will know everything. In fact, some of your templates code will be reviewed. They can download everything. And then mere studying that, you can actually know um, how the app is built. And then what comes next? Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering. So um, the login also, there's a lot of verbose login when the bug is true. It logs a lot of information, things that people are not supposed to know. I've even seen a place where it logged the secret key of an API that was being used in the Django app. So you thought your secret key is secret, but then the bug is true. So when someone comes from the locks, they can find your secret key, and then you say, yeah, somebody asked me, how did it happen? Come on, it's just this guy. <laughs> from this guy, they can see a lot of things. So this is a very, very crucial settings in Django, and you really, really need to take note of that. Look at this, page not found. Yeah, this is your favorite guy. Everybody knows. <laughs> it's bringing back memories, right? Yeah. See, you can see how the URL structure. You can even see the how, the, the, how everything is. You know, the variables and everything that you're expecting. See, this guy, I think he renamed the stuff. Okay, the admin is still admin. See the back end. Everything is there. You just need to follow the URL structure. And then when you scroll down, you see the code. Check through. Who knows, maybe you'll find the secret key and some other API keys there that you can grab and then use for stops. So this is what happens when your debug is true. Okay? So now let me... So best practices for handling this. Make sure that you have um, different 
environment settings. For example, you can have a separate settings for production and a separate settings for development. That way, uh, you won't forget. Because a lot of times, it's all about forgetting. So when, when you have two separate settings, that way you'll be able to always um, remember and then you ensure that it's working. Then the, I think the best way I would recommend is the, using the environment variables. That way, you are foolproof that nothing will happen. So with environment variables, on your local computer, you set it to true. In production, it's always false. So that way, no matter what happens, the app is reading from the environment, and then you can always be sure that um, your app is secure. Then you can use custom 404 and 500 um, error pages. This is also very, very important. This is an example, 404 page. Instead of showing the URL and stuff like that, once you have a custom page like this, you can set it up in your Django app. When someone goes to a URL that doesn't exist, you get to show them stuff like this instead of that. So environment variables. So what are environment variables? Environment variables are basically key pair values that allows you to store information outside of your main app. For example, database information, API keys, secrets. You'll be surprised that I've actually seen people encoding API keys inside their settings. I've seen it before. I recently, I was introduced to a guy he wanted me to help him do some stuff. So he, he shared their GitHub repo with me. I was shocked. The email system, all the keys and everything for their emailing is right there inside the code. So all I had to do is, in fact, if I wanted to do something, I would just copy all their settings file. Once you copy the settings file, you have the secret key, you have the API key, you have the send grid email key, you have everything right. I'm like, why do you have stuff like this? He said it's easy that way. That way they can share the code with everybody. I'm like, ah, you don't know what you're doing, no. <laughs> if somebody grabs this, you are, you are gone. So it, people actually do this a lot, and it's very, very bad. It's a bad practice. So you can use a Python package called, I use Python decouple. I use Python decouple a lot. It's very easy to use, very easy to set up. You install it, and then from there, you create an environment file like this. You put all your information in, and then you can import them from the environment file. And also, don't forget, this environment file should be in your git ignore. That's another mistake. People commit environment file. You will be surprised. Go, go to GitHub. People commit environment files. And then you go to people's GitHub and then you see the environment files. Why is the environment file there? And then you go there. So if the environment file is on GitHub, then why did you create an environment file in the first place? <laughs> Just put it in the code and let everybody be using your API keys. You understand? So this is the better way. And always make sure that your environment file is in the, in the um, Git ignore. So this is how to use decouple. With decouple, you import config, and then with config, you can import all of these values from your environment file, and then you keep your secret keys and other information private. Okay? So brute force. This is another common attack. In fact, this is like the most popular attacks that hackers use. Brute force. What's brute force? Basically, they try different combinations of username and password with the hope that one of them will work and then they'll be able to have access to your information. And that's why you don't save your, you don't use password one, two, three as your password. Eh? You create account, admin is your username, your password is password one, two, three. And then one day you now come and say, how did that person enter our app? How? You know, those are issues though. You'll be surprised. People do it. People do, I've seen things. And then you'll be wondering, admin, why is your username admin? Admin. No, so these are things that people do. And then hackers take advantage of this thing. You make their work so easy, you know. And then you see things that, things that are happening. So to protect yourself against brute force, there are packages like Django Axe that you can actually use. When you install Django Axe, Django Axe allows you to, this thing is not good. Django Axe, you know Axe, the regular Axe, A-X-E. Yeah, the regular acts. Yeah. So it helps you to protect your app against brute force. It's very simple. You install it like the normal stuff. You follow the documentation. You put it in your settings, and then it handles that for you. So another one is Django Defender, if you don't want to use Axe. So Django Defender is an alternative that helps you uh, protect against brute force attack. The next thing you can also do is to use captures, especially on your admin page. Use captures. Capture is also very good. There's a, um, there's a library, Django Simple Capture. That you can actually it will add something like this to your login form and so it's it has timeouts and some settings that you can set and this will also help you um, protect against brute force 
Another important thing you need to do is the admin URL. Please change it. This thing is not constant. Change it. When I see a Django, the first thing I try, me, myself, I'm not trying to ask you. The first thing I try is, I'll just put slash admin by default. I don't know. That thing is in me. That spirit will just tell me. Just put slash admin to see what's going to happen. You know? And that's what attackers do too. The one they see, the first thing they'll do is admin. Then I told one guy, rename it. And I guess what he did? He changed it to backend. Please, what's the difference between admin and backend? <laughs> what's the difference? Come on. You said change something, you change it to backend from admin. So I was like, seriously, out of everything in this world, this is, is backend that you can put there. Backend. So please don't let us do these things. The, the people that are coming to exploit your system, they know all these things. You'll be surprised. They know. They will try admin, they will try backend, they will try login, they will try all those things. They are trying all those things. So please make it hard, make it difficult for them. There's there's a package, I think, on the port, Django on the port. It does that. It allows you to keep your default admin. It presents a form like the regular admin page. But then the form is doing nothing. So when they are filling their form, that form, they are just wasting their time. They will be filling and submitting, and then it keeps a log of everything they have tried on that form. You know, I used it on one of my apps, and it was very nice. So as people are trying to log in, it records their IP address, the username they are trying the password and everything, and then you can see what they are trying to do on your app, and you're like, so you people have this kind of time. So <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be surprised. People do a lot of, they do a lot of stuff. And finally, my time is almost up, but I'd like to talk about this, SSL. SSL is very important. In fact, I think um, there's no way anybody should be deploying an app now without SSL. Plus, you can get it for free. There's less than script that gives you free SSL that you can actually put um, in front of your hub to make your request secure. So SSL is also a very, very important um, security measure that you can use in your Django. It helps you to protect um, communications between the back end and the front end. And that way you can also protect um, user data. So to enable SSL, what do you need? SSL certificate, then you configure your Django to work with SSL, and um, you also configure your web server. So I use NGX a lot. So if you use NGX, there's, it's very pretty, straightforward to do that with NGX. You configure your NGX to work through, work with the um, SSL certificate. Now, Django security settings. These settings are actually available in Django by default, but a lot of times people don't activate them. For every app I build, I add this line at the end of the settings file. You can see if the bug is false, all of these are activated. So the reason why I put that condition there is because if it's true, it messes up with the local development. And that is why it's not in the default Django settings. But when you are going to production, I assume that your debug is supposed to be false. And so this security are supposed to be enabled. So this is very, very important. It helps you to protect against a lot of attacks. You can see the HSCS attacks, XXS, and all those things. So this is very, very important. You should, you should, um, if you check the Django documentation, you find it there under security. You can copy all of this, and then you can put them in your Django settings. At the end of it, just leave it there permanently. So anytime you are in production environment, all of these guys will kick in, and then they will protect your um, system from acts. So wrapping up, um, we've looked, looked at authentication, web attacks, debug, environment, variables, brute force, SSL. The truth of the matter is uh, we can talk about this all day, but the real security coming comes from implementing them. You have to implement all of these things. So what I usually do is I have a checklist. Like the way they are like this, I have them written down. So whenever I do a deployment, I tick them off one after the other. Is the authentication and authorization? Check. Have I protected against um, XSS, CSRF tokens? I all, is everything in place? Check. My debug, which is very important, is it set to force? Then I double check again. Then I check, I check the environment variables. I check uh, for brute force and I check the SSL. Is everything working? A checklist like this helps us to build a more secure web. So thank you guys for listening. Any questions? Question. Question. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a very powerful talk. Nice, that's great. So I want to ask, you spoke a lot, and they were very insightful, very good as well. 
but to go through all this all the time, like all the time, have to check this and that. Is there anything we can use to to just do this for us? Some of the basic ones that we have to take care of, like using cookie cutter to start all your things, like debugging is true and all those kind of things. I, I, I think you have used cookie cutter before, have you? You see the way it's kind of wrap all these for you. You don't really have to go through the stress of checking this, checking that, checking that. And, uh, well, because it it's can be hard. It's not really a question though, but I'm trying to give a point. It can be hard, but do you think there's any other thing like cookie cutter? I don't know if the other jungle people use because that's what I use as it starts everything for me. Make sure that I'm I'm in check, I'm safe, so that this thing doesn't bother me when I'm going to, I'm going on, on production or something. Yeah. So is there anything like that to cookie cutter? So um, cookie cutter is I cookie think, cutter. Cookie cutter. Yeah. Jungle yeah. cookie cutter. Yeah. So um, the thing is, I don't think there's anything else that does that, but the reason why. For me personally, I don't use cookie cutter. I, I like to start my Django, the Django where you know. The thing is, that's one thing about, huh? I have, I have my own opinions of how I want to do things and not let somebody do it their own way for me, you get. So, <laughs> no, some people don't mind. Like, cookie cutter gives you a structure, they are, there's a way they do their own stuff. But then for me personally, I have a way I want to do my stuff. So I don't want to use someone else's template. So, and that's why for me, I have a check. There's no other way. If you want to go the easy way, you can do the cookie cutter thing and then you follow their own structure, the way they have, you know, set it up. But for someone that wants to do their own thing the way they want to do it, then uh, a simple checklist like this is fine. And by the way, you don't need that checklist at the beginning of your de development. You need it when you are deploying. So when you are deploying, you just pull it up. On the server, have I done this? Have I done this? Have I, I done this? Have I done this? Have I done this? And then, Check them off the list. Thank you. Question? Uh, I know that was a very interesting talk, right? And you would have a lot of questions, <laughs> but the time is up. Okay. So she's very merciful. She said I should do one more. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's not exactly a question, just maybe a contribution to the topic. Okay. So um, another um, security measure we can take, especially for people building fintech and payment solutions, um, is required um, around. Um, role locking and um, database optimization and stuff. Take for example, um, people, um, all right, so if you have individuals that are malicious, they are logged in on your system and they are not trying to um, access any route. They just want to probably withdraw money from like two different devices from the same account and they just make the request once. You get, so your database, if you don't implement database lock or role locking where if an operation is happening on a particular row, you lock it until that operation is completed. So I just thought I should chip that in also. And then if possible, you can at least just leverage payment solutions like Plotter and Paystack and take away that headache away from my head. Yeah, that's actually that a good one. I've, I've experienced that before. Yeah, so um, it's, I've forgotten what we used to call it. There's something we call it. It's like front running. Okay. So they, there's a script, they make multiple requests within split of a yeah. millisecond. And then they try to withdraw money using that um, that process. The truth or not, you're talking about flutter wave. The thing is, actually, things like that have also happened at flutter wave. That's yeah. the truth. There's no system that is immune. But like you said, the database lock is actually a good way to prevent that. When we had that issue, what we actually did was the database lock. So we had a lock there. So it makes sure that every transaction is completed before it initiates yeah, another so. one. And then when it's trying to initiate, it checks the balance and then it's the waves of the we even had a logging system then so we know if you tried to do that thing in our system and immediately that thing is triggered we lock your account <laughs> so that's that's actually a, okay. a, a very um, good one point. last point so also i'm um, just reminded me so when you're, um, when it comes to payment fields also i think we should stick to positive integer or positive decimal fields because mm -hmm. people may want to withdraw the negative balance yeah which at the end of the day increases mm -hmm. their balance that they have so i just yeah, so that. I actually didn't talk about those. There's no time, yeah. but then I think those that one falls under um, system design. Actually, so when you are doing your models, you are doing your system database design. These are the things that you have to put in place. If you are doing fintech, fintech is hard work. Right now, I don't recommend everybody to do fintech. Go oh, try it. It's been there since Shege. I moved on, <laughs> but then hey, it is what it is. So, Thank so, you, guys. So, are there more questions? Do we still have more questions? 
because we are waiting for others to come. So we thought, okay, let's still have, like, like okay. take more questions if you have. More questions, contributions, opinions, ideas. So, well, let's may I have a question, this. though? Since we are talking about security, and then in your security measures, you didn't talk about DDoS. So, about DDoS, I mean, DDoS. Okay, yes. okay, okay, yeah. So, and I mean, that's a very important one, right? Yeah. For that, um, if you try to tackle that on your own, you run into problems. What I usually recommend is trade up Cloudflare. Cloudflare is, um, is like, is a go-to market solution for DDoS and a lot of security issues. So with Cloudflare, they're able to detect all of these things early and they're able to protect your application from it. So there are ways you can say you want to handle it yourself, but it's very technical, especially when you are doing deployment on, on a managed server or stuff like that. But once you put Cloudflare in front of your application, you should be rest assured that 90% of that issue is automatically solved. Nice. Uh, so um, on authentication again, we have the username and password way of authenticating people. Do you still think it's still relevant in our days right now? Or we can go to password list. Like, like I'm trying to say, is it good to, to stay with the username and password thing for security reasons? Or we can go with the password list, which just send the link to the person's email, and then they just log in with the link they get. Is it very good in security wise? Okay, well, actually, I've seen a debate on that. Um, the, the problem with that is actually the UX. You know, um, people generally, it depends on the, the, the kind of, how do I put it, the, the kind of people that use your app. Um, Gen Z, they don't mind. But when, I, when you're dealing with older generations, and then you ask them to, imagine they want to log into their OPE app, and you send my mom link to go to their, to her email, to go and click link to come and log into OP, there will be problems, you know. <laughs> but that woman knows her phone number and she can just put it there and her pin and then she will log in. You understand? So the, the, that has always been the issue, the UX. If you are working with younger people, then you can do stuff like that. They know how to use technology. But when you are building a system that is going to accommodate different people from different, different age groups, then it becomes a problem. A lot of them will come and tell you that I don't understand this thing. Anytime I want to log in, they will send me something to go and check my email and stuff like that. What happens when they forget their password, email password, especially elderly people, they do that a lot. I can't remember the, how many times I've helped my dad to reset his email password. You, you, you understand? So, but for me, it works. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really don't um, recommend it. For me, um, I would recommend a mix. If you can do both, that's what most apps are doing now. They actually log in with a link or log in with your username and password. It's always good to give that option. But if you are concerned, the thing you can actually do that I think is good is 2FA. You can use SMS or email. It's pretty cool. I like that too. So you can do 2FA with SMS or email and then you can combine that with a password. But for me, magic link, all those, I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of it. You get, and also a lot of people don't find that convenient doing that. Okay, um, good one. So my question is around secret managers. So what do you think about using secret managers? So like you have all your secrets, your API keys and everything. Use that, um, that from a secret manager and basically just make those API calls and retrieve them. Um, I don't like personally, like I've not actually had to do like environment variable and all of those stuff, right? So it could be um, Azure Vault, like Google Secret Manager. What do you think about all of that? Okay, um, I think they are good, especially Azure and the likes. But I think the major issue I have with that, or why I think the adoption is slow, is one, learning curve. You actually have to learn how to use Azure Vault to start using it. Two, um, cost. You understand cost um i know you, they give you some credits and stuff like that that you can use but i know that over time you will run out of credits and then for somebody that is building a small time thing of in this part of um the world that we are every tiny little cost is important one dollar is important to 
to, to us. So for me, paying extra money to someone to keep my keys, uh, my database, username and password, and stuff like that, I don't think I have that budget. You know? Them compromised, would you rather save the costs and then risk your system like your, your app being compromised or you pay for that so that so you are guaranteed of the security? The idea of environment variables is such that uh, your, your secret keys are not, um, they are not directly inside your code such that it's not going to leak. But then if somebody is able to get your environment variables on your server, it doesn't matter whether the key is in Azure or AWS is gone. That is the truth. So if for someone to be able to get your environment variables on your server, wherever it is, if they're able to gain that kind of access, the app is gone. You understand? So normally, they can have access to your code. They can get some data here and there. But the environment variable is supposed to stay in the local environment. And the only way to retrieve that is if they actually get gain, gain access into the main system and they're able to copy that out. So. But then, no matter what happens, I actually had that discussion with one of my guys. We actually had that debate. And it was like, the, getting your keys means they've entered, they've logged into our, maybe Ubuntu server or stuff. And the moment you're in the Ubuntu server, I don't even need your environment variables if I'm in your Ubuntu server. You are gone. <laughs> you are gone. So, so, so that's just it. So it, 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 uh, to me, I feel it doesn't really, really matter. But then, if you are doing something secret, super secret or super powerful, for example, if you are building um, blockchain apps or, you know, stuff like that, that's very, very sensitive, like fintechs and stuff, just as a precaution, you can do that. I think the idea of um, cloud key storage actually came from um, companies and trying to integrate all of these into their CI, CD and all those kind of stuff so that it's easy to put them inside the CI, CD pipeline and plug all of these three together. They can retrieve the keys, do all those things without having one person manage the key, which is great. But for a small thing, I think uh, stuff like that is more like an over-engineering use case you get. So that's, that's just my opinion about it. Okay? Okay. One last question. Last question. I'm not taking any drives again. So. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So just to butcher what he said, right? Okay. So it's not 100% a question, but just to butcher what he said, right? So using Azure um, or those secret managers, they have, the, like you mentioned, they have the importance. Right? You can afford them and do that, right? But just to create a little scenario, I had an incident that my attention was called to a system that was kind of compromised, right? And on checking it, they used the environment variable. What happened? It was the local operant based on the server setting, right? They didn't deny access to that part. So someone could actually do dot on the root dot env, and they got everything on the web browser. So I just feel on both ends, right? Um, based, it just based. It's kind of based on you looking at both configure, right? That's more safer because no matter what, they can't see the code. Your code is just calling the variable and using it. But someone that didn't configure the normal environment very, very well, right, can be compromised easily. So either way, I feel like um, some safety measures still need to be taken into place. But looking at those conditions, people that don't know how to configure their server, because some of you just feel dot whatever I use, maybe dot env or dot whatever. I'm good, but some extra security measures need to be taken for that, for that kind of scenario. Okay, that's great, but I want to ask, if I have root access to your server and your keys on Azure, do you think that I can find a way to call Azure to retrieve that data from your server? Yeah, but looking at this scenario, I think, yes, yeah, so like you mentioned, right, if I was access to the server, you have everything, because you can run your script and call it, yeah. Exactly. But in that scenario, right, I don't, I, Actually, I didn't have access to their server. Just kind of a bit, a bit uh, some careless activity. Just putting dots, right? I saw it without having us to SSH to the server. So in such near now, that would have been a safer place. If okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, get, I get, Yeah, okay. I think I, I get that now. Okay. Yeah, that's that's true. That's possible. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I think your time is up, right? Thank you for taking so much time.